Hey, what's happening, Transformation Church family, and to those of you who are new as our virtual guests, my name is Pastor Derwin. I'm one of the pastors here at Transformation Church. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and like we traditionally do, I want to just say what's up to all of the guests who are viewing literally from various corners of the world. What a great time to be alive, that instead of all roads leading to Rome, uh, we have this beautiful gift called the internet in which we can continue to worship and influence in ways for the gospel that perhaps has never, ever been possible. And to the TC family, um, I love you. I pray for you daily, and I thank you so much. We are starting a brand new series, a four-week series entitled God, Why? God, Why? And in a series like this, don't tell anybody, but I'm going to use a big word here. It's called a apologetic series. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia in 1 Peter 3.15, and it means to give a defense for. In the Greco-Roman world, lawyers would give an apologia. And so what we want to do, though, is given a defense for why we believe what we believe is not merely intellectual. It, it, it touches the cognitive, cognitive capacity but also our will and emotions and actions. But we really want to walk through some difficult, difficult questions, and particularly to the preteens and Gen Z and younger millennials, uh, we want to get you grounded early in understanding, you, you know, God, why? And the first message we're going to look at is, God, why is there evil and why is there suffering? Um, I would say the biggest challenge to historic biblical Christianity is what philosophers call the problem of evil. But here's the thing, the problem of evil is a problem for every single world view. In some Eastern philosophies or religion, evil is simply the ramifications of your karma. Uh, for some, it, it is an illusion, it's not really real. But what I want to discuss just briefly before we dive into the heart of the message is I want to talk to my friends who are, who are atheists. Atheism is relatively new to the historic landscape of humanity. And atheism just says that, that there is no God. And one of the strongest arguments that atheists have for there is no God is the problem of evil and suffering. But that is a problem for my atheist friends. And one of the things here is we wanna create a safe space. So if you're watching and you heard about this series and you're like, man, this is a great opportunity to shoot holes through the Christian faith and tear down people's faith, uh, we want you to know that you're welcome. We wanna welcome you because we believe that God does have answers, but that answer is more than just philosophical, intellectual exercise. We believe that answer is a person named Jesus, but this is what I would say to my atheist friends lovingly and respectfully. Every single time we say there's something wrong with the world, every time we say there's something evil and, and we want justice, this is what I'll say back is this. Your longing for justice and beauty and for all sad things to become untrue is actually a longing for God. Here's why. In an atheistic worldview where we're simply the product of random mutations and chemicals, how do we even know what's right or wrong unless there's a standard of right or wrong? As a matter of fact, C.S. Lewis, who is so dear to so many followers of Jesus, actually said this when he made his trip from atheism into following Jesus. He said this, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. Just how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What I was comparing this universe with when I called it unjust. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume 
that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. And in C.S. Lewis's classic book, Mere Christianity, he points that out. Also, contemporary atheism says that man does not have free will, that we are simply the product of all of genetic mutations. So my response is, if I don't have free will, then I can't really change my mind, and neither can you. So why are you trying to convince us that God does not exist when your very worldview does not consist of the ability to make a choice. And here's the bottom line. Everyone is going to experience the effects of evil and suffering. So my thing is, we may might as well do it with Jesus in our corner. We're all going to experience evil and suffering. We're going to experience the effects of evil and suffering. And so we might as well do it with Jesus in our corner. Let me use a theological word. We might as well suffer redemptively. What does suffering redemptively mean? It means this, that our God, who is sovereign, that doesn't mean he is a ruling dictator that controls everything meticulously. It means this, because God is eternal, he lives in the now. Nothing ever catches him by surprise. It means this, because God is loving, he's always working it out for those who love him. It means this, because God is all-knowing, he knows what's best for us, even in the midst of a chaotic, broken world. So, God does not waste our suffering. Now, we can if we choose not to trust him, but God doesn't want to waste our suffering. He actually wants to use it. So teenagers, check this out. Millennials, evil and suffering do not belong in God's good creation. As we go back to the early primordial scripture of Genesis, we we learn that God's creation is good, all right? God's creation is good. Evil and suffering do not belong in it, and one day they will be vanquished fully. So the kingdom of God is here, but not fully. That'll happen when Jesus returns. So where does evil and suffering come from? Well, the Bible gives us a framework of this reality, It says this in Romans chapter five, verse 12. This is written by a Jewish scholar by the name of Paul. He says this, therefore, just this sin, now understand this sin means this, that I am willfully rejecting my role as a partner with God to build his kingdom. Sin is not just an action, sin is also a dark power. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, this is Adam, in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve everything. The garden was a temple. Adam and Eve was God's priest, and their job was to reproduce and populate the earth with image bearers for God and his glory. But God gave them a choice. He said, listen, you can have every tree in the garden, but do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because when you do, you will die. Now, here comes the question, and this is a good question. Why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? All he had to do was keep the tree of life, because love demands a choice. Love demands a choice. Now, of course, God knew what Adam and Eve was gonna do. He's not caught by surprise, and God in his wisdom said, this is the best way to go about it. And so when Adam and Eve chose the sin, it jacked us up. And look at this, not only sin, but then death through sin. In this way, death spread to all people because all sin, physical death and spiritual death. Now, I know what you're saying. You're going, Derwin, that's not fair. Why should I be penalized for Adam's sin? Let me ask you a question. Why do you look like your parents? Why do your parents look like their parents? And it goes all the way back. Just as we inherit physical characteristics, we inherit spiritual characteristics. By the way, that's why Jesus came in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, says that Jesus is the last Adam. So what the first Adam messed up, the second Adam came to clean up. What the first Adam cursed, the second Adam came to bless. What 
Adam blew, Jesus says, I'm gonna blow you a kiss of grace and transform your life. If you were to see my dad when he was alive, I am a five foot 11 carbon copy of his five foot four self. It is, I mean, it is like looking in a mirror when I look at my dad. I'm just a bigger version of him. I didn't choose that, that's what I got. Well, Adam and Eve genetically gave the world and creation this disease called evil and suffering, and because God loves us, he has a huge story of redemption. So what do we do? This is what, this is, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna walk through some scripture, and you're gonna help me become a better preacher this week. You're like, what, what, what does that mean? It means this. So stop scrambling your eggs and bacon for a minute. It means, it means this. All throughout the week, I'm gonna give you Romans chapter eight, verses 18 through 39 to read and to journal through, and that's gonna compound the effect of this message because this is important for us to wrestle with this, particularly in this season of utter chaos. Oh my gosh, political chaos. I mean, who in the world would ever think we're living through a pandemic? Are you kidding me? Like that's the stuff in, in, in the ancient days, not in the 21st century. Civil unrest, all types of stuff all around the world. And it's important that in the middle of the chaos, we have to look to the cross. God does not waste suffering lest you and I not waste it. Check this out now. Evil and suffering doesn't compare to the awaiting glory. Evil and suffering doesn't compare to the awaiting glory. I remember at 9-11, that was a horrific and tragic time, and we as a family were gonna go uh, during spring break. We were, uh, not actually it was in the fall, we were heading down to Disney World, or whichever one is in F Florida. That's where we were going. Jeremiah was real young, traffic was crazy because no one was playing uh, or, or flying, and so we got from Ballantyne to Rock Hill, for those of you who are not in this area, that means we went about 10 or 12 miles, and Jeremiah was in his car seat, and he goes, Dad, are we there yet? I was like, son, you gotta get your mind right. We ain't even left the state of South Carolina. Well, guess what? In the midst of evil and suffering, we gotta get our minds right, because we got a destination called the new heavens and the new earth, and what God has for those of us who are resurrected with Christ is gonna blow our everlasting minds. It's gonna do a work in us. And please understand this, please understand this. And I wanna correct this. Please understand this, that when we get to the new heavens, new earth, we are not gonna be infant babies with ings, wings. Humans don't turn into angels. That's a downgrade. Angels are not made in the image of God. Humans are. We're not gonna sit around just singing to Jesus all day. The new heavens and new earth is gonna be a greater version of what the, what the garden was supposed to be. We're gonna have jobs. We're gonna do, we're gonna co-rule and reign with Jesus. It's going to be epic. And so it's important that our evil and suffering today do not compare to the waiting glory. I'm gonna see my grandmother again and she won't have cancer in her body and we'll be able to fish. Some of you going, Durham, what do you mean we're gonna be able to fish? Remember when Jesus rose from the dead? What was he doing on the beach when Peter and all them were fishing? He was grilling fish. How did he grill the fish? Jesus caught the fish, praise God. <laughs> you guys know I like to fish, by the way. Romans 8, 18, Paul says this, for I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worth, listen to this, are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So this is the way it works. If we die before Jesus returns, our spirits go to be with the Lord, our bodies go to the ground. But then when Jesus comes back, there's a new heavens and there's a new earth and we have new glorified resurrected bodies. Revelation says the holy city came down and God was with his people. That is epic. That is beautiful. And please understand this. It is not us simply singing. Yes, singing is going to be a part of it. Worship is going to be a part of it. But all of life will be worship, co-ruling, co-reigning with Jesus. And our present suffering does not compare. Evil and suffering reminds us that all of creation needs redemption. The power of Jesus' blood is so epic that even Creation itself will heal. No earthquakes, no tornadoes, no mudslides, 
no tsunamis, no famine, no all this jacked up stuff. Watch this. And I want you to notice the connection here. Paul says, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons and daughters to be revealed. So our resurrection from the dead is also creation's resurrection to be made new. New heavens, new earth. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him. That's Adam who subjected it in the hope, verse 21, that creation itself will also be set free from bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. So right now, creation is experiencing bondage, it is experiencing decay, and it is also longing for the new heavens and new earth, longing for our resurrection. Understand this, get your mind right. A vision of the future transforms what you do today. A vision of the future transforms what you do, do today. If I can take you back to my previous life, one of the things that I learned in high school and I followed in college and in the National Football League and moms and dads, regardless if you play sports, this will help you. Practice for most people is not fun. People wanna get to the game and play. But players that are really good understand that the game is practice. So you practice so hard that the game is easy. You prepare so well that the game is easy. So what God is saying to us is get our minds right and understand that a vision of the future transforms what we do today. Watch this. For we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together with labor pains. Wow, labor pains. Paul uses this imagery of a woman in labor, oh my gosh, that's painful. He's saying that's happened in creation. But look at this, not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits. In the Old Testament, the first fruits was the first offering of grain and produce to the Lord. It's like the tithe. So God is saying we as humans in Christ are the first fruits that Jesus is offering us back to God. By the way, isn't that beautiful? That, that Jesus, through his sinless life, his beautiful, heinous death on the cross in our place, disgrace to give us grace, and in his resurrection says, here, Dad, here's my gift to you. Here's my first fruits. Have you ever thought about that? That you are God's first fruit, that God the Son gives you and says, here, 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 Dad, I, I give them to you. I don't know how you've been rejected. I don't know how you've been neglected. But I do know this, in Christ you are accepted. And what the Father says is thank you, son, for these first fruits. You are his first fruits. We also groan within ourselves. Er, let me park right here. My, 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 my. Wow. We groan within ourselves. My, my, my. You know what that means? What's happening on the outside is nowhere near as bad as what's happening on the inside. In Matthew 7, Jesus dropped this knowledge. He dropped it like it was hot. He dropped it. He said this, what's on the inside is what defiles a person. And he starts with evil thoughts. The scene of the crime is your, say it at home, the scene of the crime is your, one more time, the scene of the crime is your, mind, evil thoughts, and then goes into sexual morality and, and all this messed up stuff. So we, as followers of Jesus, are even groaning, saying, God, why am I still struggling with this? God, why is this? God, why? By the way, if you have conviction, that's different than condemnation. That's different than guilt. Condemnation and guilt says this, you are evil. Conviction says what you did was evil, but it's not a reflection of who you are in Christ. Discern the difference. Condemnation and guilt push you from God. Conviction moves you into the arms of a loving God. Eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Wow. Even as we're physically getting older, man, we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. So understand this, heaven is not this place where we're clearless or babies with dirty diapers on and wings flapping around. No, we are glorified, resurrected 
with the perfect bodies in the perfect element, worshiping a perfect God and co-ruling and co-reigning with him. Evil and suffering teaches us to see the invisible. Whoa. Evil and suffering teaches us to see the invisible. You're like, Derma, what you talking about? Well, let's see what Paul's talking about through the Holy Spirit. He says this. Now, in this hope, we are saved. So, so the word hope biblically doesn't mean like, man, I sure hope that happens. Biblical hope is this. I know it's going to happen. You go, Derwin, well, why do you have such confidence? Because it's in Jesus and not me. But why do you have confidence in Jesus? Because Jesus rose from the dead. I've been to Jerusalem, and there are two historic spots where they say Jesus was buried, and in both spots, he ain't there. And because he's not there, our hope in a new heavens and a new earth, our hope in the power of God, our hope in the kingdom of God, our hope in the presence of, of Jesus is not simply, well, I hope so. It's a, I hope, but I know. Check this out. Now, in this hope, we are saved. This simply doesn't mean entrance into God's kingdom. It means that God keeps on saving us. He keeps holding us. He keeps moving us. He keeps transforming us. When we fall down, he picks us up. When we get prideful, he humbles us. He's always there with us, saving us. But, y'all ready for the big but? But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. We began to see the invisible. What do I mean by, by that? We began to see God's invisible kingdom working when we don't even know it. Friends, if someone would have told me a year ago at this time, the Transformation Church's sermons would be downloaded and listened to 100,000 times per week, I would say you're crazy. I would say that's, I don't even know how that would be possible. But through TBN and through our online platforms, literally 100,000 plus people are watching. Are you kidding me? We couldn't put 100,000 people in a building. By the way, I cannot wait until we can get back and celebrate. I'm gonna hug y'all. I'm gonna give you chest bumps. I might get so excited. <clears throat> I might tackle you back in my NFL days. I've been riding my bike and lifting weights. I may give you a concussion, but just know I love you. But here's my point. Here's my point though. We wait patiently. Knowing that God is moving, knowing that God is working, knowing that God is active, that he's doing 100,000 things that we can't even see it. We may be able to see one, but that's just enough. So understand this, that we begin to see the invisible, that God's kingdom becomes visible. It's the eyes of faith. Why? Because he's faithful. He is trustworthy. Evil and suffering teaches us to pray in the spirit Evil and suffering teaches us to pray in the spirit. What does that mean? Paul helps us. Now remember the context is suffering. The context is difficulty. Paul says this, in the same way, the spirit. Now understand this, God the Holy Spirit is a person. We believe that Yahweh is revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit, that God is eternally tripersonal, and the third person of our triune God is the Holy Spirit. He's not an electrical force. He is a person that indwells us. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Once again, like the 12-year-old said in the letter that he wrote me, check this out now, we are strong when we're weak. When we're vulnerable and we say, God, I need you, that's when we're the strongest. Because we do not know what to pray for as we should. Let's pause here. In the midst of this broken world, family, teenagers, young adults, old folks, all of us, there are things that are gonna be so beyond us we're not even gonna know what to pray for. Ages 42 through 46, I am 49 now, ages 42 through 46 were hard. Church was thriving. 
oh my gosh, they were so hard. There were some extended family issues. And man, when you love people and they're hurting, it hurts you in places that you never, ever thought you could hurt. And I remember days getting out of the bed because I didn't want to wake up Vicky from praying and crying, that my face would be buried in the floor, and all I could do is this. That's all I could do is like this mumble, mm, this hum. That's all I could. I didn't know what to pray for. I was exhausted. I didn't know what to pray for. But the good news is God, the Holy Spirit, knows what to pray for. And he's interceding us and he's guiding us and he's directing us. Check this out. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, I know I said his name wrong. My son Jeremiah is gonna correct me on that, which is cool, but you know I don't know all them languages like he knows, but Soren Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher, he said this. A man prayed, and at first he thought, that prayer was talking. But he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer was listening. And check this out. Your ears and my ears are tuned to listen to God as we study scripture. In the words of Eugene Peterson, the great pastor, eat this book, eat the Bible, consume it. I read a study that said, 32% of believers read the Bible every day. That's like saying 32% of followers of Jesus eat one meal a day. Listen, Netflix is not gonna give you what the Bible can give you. Amazon Prime is not gonna give you what the Bible can give you. Your video games is not gonna give you what the Bible can give you. Oftentimes what we do is we numb ourselves and we entertain ourselves into oblivion and what COVID has done is it has shut all that down and we got a choice. We can run to that or we can run to the Lord. If you wanna hear God's voice, It is in the Bible. Our ears become more tuned to the voice of God as we listen to the rhythm of his grace through scripture. But prayer is allowing the Holy Spirit to intercede for us because it's so far beyond us at times. Family, evil and suffering showcases God's sovereign redemptive purposes in your life. Let me explain this. Showcase means to show off. God loves showing off. But sometimes we miss it because our focus is on the chaos instead of the cross. The word sovereign, once again, does not mean that God is like meticulous and we're robots. It simply means that God is ruling and reigning and governing. Now remember, some of you go, well, if God is ruling and reigning, why doesn't he get rid of evil? You know what, if God decided to get rid of all evil right now, he would start with me and you. When we understand the holiness of God, the otherness of God, we understand, oh God, wait, wait, don't come yet because there's more people that need to know you. Don't wrap it up yet because there's more people to know you. But simultaneously we go, oh, holy God, I want to be with you. I want to be in your presence. And he goes, I am with you. I am present with you. I am Emmanuel. I am with you. Now go into the world and tell them, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Sovereign redemption means that God does not waste our pain. He does not waste our suffering. His redemptive purpose in our life is to make us Jesus Christ lookalikes. Romans 8, 28 through 30, we know that some things work. We know that maybe things work. No, no. We know that all things work, what, together for the good of those who love God. Now, this is only for those who love God, who are committed to Jesus, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The word foreknew simply means God knew in advance. The word predestined means God is predetermined. So God has predetermined that whoever believes in his son, Jesus, will be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. This is God's goal for you. If you wanna know God's aim, God's goal for you, here it is. 
He wants to make you a Jesus Christ lookalike. I've been saying this for 10 years. It's good to my soul. I hope it's good for you. Imagine loving like Jesus for just a minute. Imagine having the mind of Jesus for just a minute. Imagine having the patience of Jesus, the kindness of good Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, the presence and power and glory of Jesus. Imagine that. Well, guess what? You don't have to imagine it. The Holy Spirit wants to do it in us, and God uses all things to do it. That means even evil and suffering. As Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50 verse 20, his brother sold him into slavery at age 17 and at age 30, he was the second leading ruler in all of Egypt and he said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Listen family, oh, if I wish I could hug you right now. I wish I could hold you. I wish I could whisper this in your ear but there's somebody more important, someone more powerful, the infinite God himself is in you whispering in your ear and saying this, what the enemy means for evil, I mean for good. Hold my nail-pierced hands. Trust me when you don't understand. When you can't see, let me give you eyes to see the invisible. When you don't feel my presence, let me give you faith to know that I'm present. When you don't understand, lean not on your own understanding, but trust the Lord and make all your paths in his way, and he will guide you so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. In his humanity, Jesus is our elder brother and we're taking upon his family resemblance. As the second person of Yahweh, we, we worship him along with the Father and the Spirit. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. God declares us righteous, Jew and Gentile. Everyone is equally clothed in Christ. And those he justified, he also glorified. Isn't this awesome that God in eternity past has already set up your future in eternity in a new heavens, new earth? It is a done deal. So in other words, you and I are living from victory, not for victory. You and I are living from affirmation, not for affirmation. You and I are living from the overcoming power of Jesus not to overcome. He already did it. We just walk in it by faith. Family, evil and suffering <clears throat> reminds us that we are more than conquerors in Christ. Paul says this, what then are we to say about these things? That's all the things that are going on, the decay of the earth, the battle within us, evil and suffering. He goes, well, what are we to say about all this? He goes, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let me say this to you, Transformation Church, and let me say this to our family and friends who are watching. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us. How do we know? Because the cross was bloody. How do we know? Because the tomb is empty. When you don't know and the only thing you can remember that evil and suffering is so bad, the only thing you can remember is that the cross was bloody and that the tomb is empty. You got all you need. Verse 32, he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? And everything is, he called us, he justified us, he glorified us, he sanctified us, this is all talking about his redemptive work. That's the, that's the everything. So keep that in mind. God is more concerned with our character, not our comfort. And understand this, we live in a broken world. It's not yet fixed. And when we go, God, fix it, he goes, I have and I am, and I want you to join me in it. Verse 33, who can bring accusation against God's elect? Simply, election means this, that Christ was God's elect one, and because we're in Christ, we share in his election, and election has to do with service and mission and purpose. God is the one who justifies. Check this out now. Who is the one who condemns us? Watch this, watch this. Christ is the one who died. Now, think about all the things Paul the Apostle could have said. 
He could have said, here's four ways to overcome anxiety in a tough time. Here are three ways to meet a felt need. He goes, here it is. You want to understand? Oh, in the words of public enemy, bam, in your face, here it is. Even more has been raised. And he is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Oh, did you hear the theology? The Holy Spirit intercedes for us, Romans 8, 26. And Jesus is praying for us. In the words of Johnny Gill, my, 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 oh my goodness, Jesus is praying for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you. Don't look at the chaos. Look at the cross. Look at the empty tomb. Don't look at the chaos. Look at the cross. Don't look at the empty tomb. Now remember, when Paul wrote this, there wasn't 24-hour news cycles. When Paul wrote this, there wasn't apps. So a lot of times we're focusing on the wrong things and not focusing on the one who is seated above. Here's the thing, where is your gaze? For whatever you gaze at, you become like. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Notice what Paul says, like he doesn't go, who can separate us from our job? Who can separate us from our mortgage? Who can separate us from our dreams? No, he goes right to the heart of the issue. Who can separate us from the Messiah? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? If Paul was writing today, he would say this, can COVID-19 separate us? Can political division separate us? Can persecution separate us? Can a busted up economy separate us? Can opiate addiction separate us? He goes on. As it is written, because you were being put to death all day long, we we're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Watch this now, watch this. Paul goes, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you hear this? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let me say it again for the people in the back. Let me hold you up for a minute. Let me join the Holy Spirit in rallying your soul that in the midst of evil and suffering, we are more than conquerors in him who loved us. That word conqueror is hypernike. It means victorious. It means to keep on winning, but winning in God's economy is not winning like man's economy. Winning in God's economy is you become more humble. You become more kind. You become more purposeful. You become more merciful. You become more gracious. You see what I'm saying? You become more like Christ. That's what winning is. Some of us don't want to win, though. We want to win by man's standards. Verse 38, I love this, the way Paul finishes with a rhetorical flash. He goes, for I am persecuted that neither death. In other words, you go, you kill me, I'm going to be with Jesus. You leave me, I'm staying with Jesus on mission with him. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, that's the demonic realm, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Family, evil and suffering is a problem for every worldview. We may as well suffer redemptively. We may as well take, through God's grace, what the enemy means for evil, and God uses it for good, and the good is God conforms us to the image of Christ, and we continue the ministry and mission of Christ in all of life. You, precious child, are more than a conqueror in Christ. His grace is sufficient. His presence is everlasting, and his sovereign goodness is holding you in his nail-pierced don't look at the chaos, look at the cross. Don't look at the confusion, look at the empty tomb. And remember, the Holy Spirit is praying for you and Jesus is praying for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? Family, will you pray with me? Let's pray. 
Holy Spirit, in the matchless name of Jesus and to the Father's glory, I pray that the words that have been proclaimed, your words, would, would, would stick to our ribs, would feed us deep down in our soul, would encourage us, would, would strengthen us, would, would convict us, would transform us. That in the midst of evil and suffering, we look to the cross. In the midst of confusion, we look to the empty tomb. God, you don't waste suffering. May we not waste it. And right now, I wanna to talk to those of you who are saying, hey, preacher, I'm not sure if I know Jesus. I'm, I'm not sure if I follow him, but I'm ready to follow him. I'm ready to give my life to him. Hey, hey, today is your day. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Today is your day. Right here, right now, bow your knee to Jesus and receive the greatest gift of all. God is for us, not against us. How do we know? Because he did not spare his own son who died for us and who rose again. Today, let Jesus shape your life. Pray with me. Today's your day to be forgiven. Today's your day to be made new. Today is your day to know the greatest love that you can ever know, the love of Jesus. In the silence of your heart, right where you are, I want you to pray. Lord Jesus, today I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you died for my sins on that bloody rugged cross. You were displaced to give me grace. I believe that on the third day you rose again, defeating death. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you now live in me and I'm a part of your family called the body of Christ. Today I say yes to you. Amen, amen, and amen.